at, at home, all our animals are shelter animals, the horses, the cats, or the dogs. And I want to give you an example for the dogs. If a dog come to us, which lives six or five years on a chain somewhere, the dog come to our farm and it sit down and it never leaves his place because he doesn't learn that before. In the five or six years before, he get one place and stay there the entire day. And the same happened to us over the years. We commute to the offices, we go to a desk, we talk to a machine, work was invisible, we had no idea what the neighbor is doing, exploration, social learning, no chance. And now, boom, it's a new time. Rafael Gilgen is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. We have known each other for a little while, and uh, luckily I've gotten the honor to uh, be able to call him uh, Rafa. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Rafael. Uh, he's very unique. It's kind of a person that in your company you'd say, who's that crazy guy? What's his job? What does he do? He's always gone. He pops into the office and, you know, tells us and he's in this utopian space type of world. And then he takes off again. And uh, everybody in the office listens to him. It's kind of one, one of these guys that your colleagues would say, oh, he's got an ir irrepressible curiosity a relentless search for explanation and the desire to turn everything upside down in this world. And, and it sometimes for others can be uncomfortable to be around him because he's kind of always pushing that status, that is status quo. And when he returns to the office after these long journeys, he, he talks about things like a virtual utopia that sounds like he's lived in some kind of alternate reality. Uh, that's because Raphael is a trend scout. He's an innovator, a futurist, a, a trend scout, and he looks all over the world for new trends, reads books, um, and he has spent most of his professional life working on making the office environment a better place. Even some of his own colleagues think he's a little crazy. He, he He's really, you know, he's out there. Um, and the, the other thing to kind of know about him is that he works for Vitra and uh, they have this approach to improving the quality of offices and public spaces through the power of design by serving the varied Vitra team with the results of his observations, cognitions, and trend clusters, market analysis, and really hard business cases. Rafa, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here, my crazy friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the kind introduction. <laughs> oh, you're, you're most welcome. I'm glad you're here because we have absolutely tons to discuss. And I'm sure we're going to get into um, a, a lot of wonderful topics. So it couldn't, have, it couldn't have really come at a better time because we've just played this uh, this crazy experiment and still are are playing it on the future of work the future of life the 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 where where are we going with the future and how uh now in germany we're in our third or fourth severe lockdown where now people aren't even really going to work anymore in, in, in a lot of cases uh if possible they're uh, being requested so with all this trend scouting the future of work and not only architecture and design and, and how offices and these spaces, has that prepared you to all of a sudden have a whole year almost now with little travel and staying put in one spot? How, how, have, you, how have you gotten through this time? What's happened? Has all the stuff you've been talking about given you resilience or get us up to speed? Yeah, so, um, so uh, honestly, when, when it hit me, I would say first, uh, at the end of 2019, uh, I had a year with tons of travels. It was about 25 countries, always the airports was packed wherever I was. And I thought, oh my God, the planet is real in a bad position because how we do business that could not 
that could not be the way, but I had no idea what could be the alternative. And then uh, in a predictable life, the unpredictable a pandemic comes into our life. And after three weeks or four weeks, I, I, I had a little bit fear personal wise because I thought, hey, Rafa, your job is game over because <laughs> you can't travel, you can't meet people. My entire relevance at Vitra was based on personal interactions. And I thought, oh my God, so what do you know? Because I thought, I don't want to reinvent myself again, like three or four or five times before in my life. But then I have to reinvent myself. I go for a camera setup. I built at home in my big studio, a smaller proper TV studio. I start to write um, uh, um, uh, storybooks for the first sessions. And then I, I start, I think in April with my first sessions. I was 13 weeks on my farm in one block. I was never before 13 weeks in one block on my farm. My family got me every day. After a while, they freak out. And then in my 20, I leave the first time my home coming to the Vitra campus. At that time, the Vitra campus was empty, but it was so good to be here first. And second is, and then I start my, I would say, my little Rafa TV show, my webcast sessions. I ended up with more than 300 sessions last year all over the world. The biggest one was with 500 people from our Japan community, <laughs> totally freaky, 90 minutes and nobody leave the session, 90 minutes, come on. But honestly, I always was, I also was done then at the end of the year. So that was my year. Yeah. And I joy, I enjoy to be so many days at home because now I know every, every single trail in my forest, I bought a kayak to go on my river and nap. Uh, frequently in the evenings so from that perspective i enjoy it yeah and i really critical think about the the climate change from that point yeah because i thought i had time to think about it i would not say before i had the time to think about it but it was really like with a high five with the chair into your face so you, you work uh, really in, in all different countries all over the world with a lot of uh, small, medium enterprises, but also there's some, some big names on, on your list as well. Um, but but a, lot of, a lot of the companies that you work with um, probably are not thinking of these moonshots or these big, hairy, audacious goals where they're going to save the world or change it. They're, it's a different mindset. Now, I'm surprised to hear from you what what I just heard. And I want to tell you why, because uh, as a trend scout, as someone who sees these different environments of how work is, um, that, that there's a big psychology that also goes along with this. And we'll kind of get into the, the more of that as, as also your discussions and talks on how, how you see that the, the future of work, humans of new work, things like that, and, and how that occurs. But didn't that give you a little bit of prepare, preparedness of what, what, was, what was coming and, and what the future for not only your clients, but for yourself and what that would be like? And, and that you say, okay, eventually it, 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 it's going to happen. Um, that, that, that's the first surprise. And then I, I just want to, before we go into that question, I, I want to clarify for my listeners, and, and you can clarify, you kind of did a little bit. You uh, live on a farm in Regensburg or close, close there, and it's a beautiful place, a lot of nature. And so you have one of the, I, that, I was also surprised to hear that your family is going crazy, that you're spending so much time there because you have one of the most beautiful human zoos you could wish for. You're out in the nature, you're kind of on this farm, you've got open spaces and can even distance yourself from your family if they get on your nerves. Um, so I, I, I'm, you've shocked me in a couple of ways. So you now have got to clarify wh what have you been working on all these years and why the hell haven't you applied it into your life a little more so that you would be prepared or did I totally misunderstand? 
<laughs> okay, starting with my family. You know, I'm so curious. I want to understand everything. I talk a lot. I jump through the topics from one topic to the other one. And, and I need for sure a kind of an audience. I need to talk to someone. And for that reason, I talk during breakfast, lunch, and dinner to my family, hardcore. And in all the topics, I talk normally to my, to customers, to people like you, uh, to all these people at the forefront, uh, if it is startups, universities, whatever. And I think that was a little bit overwhelming for my family. That, that was the reason. They became they, your business colleagues. They became your yeah. office colleagues, so to say. And, and you know what? There's one secret to keep Rafa calm, give him hard work on the farm. So I'd, I had an entire week to, to go out to harvest the firewood for the next winter, like for this winter. And in that week, I was really calm because working in the forest, going for the trunks, you are at the evening real tired. It's like an entire workout session. So that, that to my family. To the business topic, for sure, I was, I, I, I was totally convinced that we, we, that it was um, monkey business to commute every day to the office to spend the rest of the day in front of a machine. For sure, I believe there is in front of us before COVID a mixed reality that will change everything. And we set up since 2017 hackathons all over the world with topics, what remains from the physical world? Uh, how could your life be in an entire mixed reality and so on? But it's like you talk always, we have to go to the Mars. We have to go to the Mars. We will achieve that. And now it's true. Now we are on planet Mars. And now it's up to us to execute all our ideas. And I think that makes a difference. I love that. So um, we're definitely going to get in some more of that because I've heard a number of your talks and, and you start out actually very similar to me, but I, I don't want to touch on on the space topic just yet. What, what I do want to talk about is, and I'm also this, um, even though I'm an environmentalist, a, a big global food reformist, I'm almost a trend scout myself. I'm thinking about sustainable innovations of future. I'm thinking, how can we work sustainably in the future? How can we do things differently with different tools? What does the future of work look like that doesn't have an impact on human health and on human suffering and on our environment. And so I really uh, uh, think about that in, in many respects. So in some respects, I'm also a trend scout in this kind of, you know, what does the future work? And for example, uh, this is an audio podcast, but it's also a video portion. And on, on those who are watching the video can see that both you and I are standing. I've been standing for work over 18, maybe even close to 20 years now. When I very first started, I was turning garbage cans upside down and used all sorts of crazy tips and tricks and tools because desks weren't always available the way I wanted them, you know, these drivable standing desks. And so I even went to monkey desks and did all sorts of hacks to, to make it workable. Um, and before that, I was thinking about what different types of chairs, kneeling chairs and other chairs that would get me more in and leaning chairs into a standing position. And how do you make that trend? And uh, so in some respects, there's this, you know, how do you work in the future and how, how, how does that happen? My, my, my question is, um, th now these, this subject has come up for, I, I would say the majority of the world's population has had to address during this lockdown period, if they were allowed to work from home, are they going to work from their bed? Are they going to work from their couch? Are they going to work from the kitchen table? Do they have an office? So they're seeing their human zoo a little bit closer. And um, they're also learning that if you work eight hours a day from the couch or the bed, that eventually your back hurts or you never get out of your pajamas or whatever. And eventually you're running into some ergonomic and some health issues. And so, um, uh, I want you to kind of answer th that trend on just the ergonomics, the occupational health and safety aspects 
of setting up your work life that you deal with as well. I mean, that's a trend and you have those swatches behind you, 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 you know, where, where things are going. That's kind of what Vitra does in some respects as well. So I want to hear how you've seen that evolved. And then I want to address the anthrop after you answer that, I want to address the Anthropocene of chairs, the Anthropocene of desks and, and things, what we're seeing some trends starting to emerge. Ooh, big question. So uh, yeah, coming yeah. coming to your to the first topic, I see, I believe what we learn is that there is a, a mismatch how we deal with space. Think about the cities. The most of the cities was a little bit like sleep cities. Your home was so 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 tiny that you have maybe you have your bedroom and maybe your kitchen and kitchen combination with a an open space or living room. So that means our sociology setup, how we live, was not prepared anymore to have a proper house. And I don't believe that is a question of the size of the floor of your flat. I believe it was like the entire industry served the houses. Yeah. Now we see all the houses, it seems like they're a little bit too small because there was not additional space anymore to stay there for work. On the opposite, all after the first lockdown, when the most people come back to the office, they go into the office and say, oh my God, that looks like 1999. I don't want to work here anymore because they learn it makes not sense why a big portion of their work was routine task they could do done from everywhere. So and then they start to avoid commuting. And now something interesting happens people start to think what, how to make minded places. So what is the best place to do the best task you have to do? Maybe you have to write a good narrative. You go there where you get kind of inspiration about the people you write about. Maybe you have to prepare a paper for your CFO. Maybe do that at home because you don't want to be disturbed. Or maybe you, the, the task is so big that you need help, then you go to the office because you have your coworkers. I think first, people references now their task into a space in general. And now when we go to the smaller setting, you talk about the ergonomy topics. I believe a, a great example is an exercise hall. The strongest body language uh, an exercise hall at school has a strong body language because you go in and you immediately know how to deal with the space because every item, you know what to do with it. And I think here starts ergonomy in terms of an activity. So what we have to learn is how to code, how to code um, objects like furniture by a semantic language that people immediately understand, hey, I can do this and that and that and that, and maybe much more than the designer believe what to do with that, to give them kind of um, variances. Yeah. And I think that was, and that we also learn like, we don't want to be located anymore at the desk because that, that seems like mass farming. Yeah. Currently, we are discussing how we take care about. Uh, organic farms, that all the animals should have a better place to stay as long as they grow before, before we eat them. But in the, on the same way, we organized 10 years our own workspaces. Yeah, that it's not only <clears throat> our living conditions, but it's also our schooling conditions, our work conditions. For sure. It, <clears throat> It's uh, um, education, not only at the university level, but at the grade school level. It yeah. hasn't changed since the beginning of the industrial revolution, even before that. And um, there's very few that are starting to make that transition. But even now we see this, this shift in, the, in not only consciousness, but an awareness on how it needs to change and why those systems or those environments aren't working. I want, <laughs> to, bring an, I want to bring an example. At, at home, all our animals are shelter animals, the horses, the cats, or the dogs. I want to give you an example for the dogs. If a dog come to us, which lives six or five years on a chain somewhere, 
the dog come to our farm and it sit down and it never leaves his place because he doesn't learn that before. In five or six years before, he get one place and stay there the entire day. And the same has happened to us over the years. We commute to the offices, we go to a desk, we talk to a machine, work was invisible, we had no idea what the neighbor is doing, exploration, social learning, no chance. And now, boom, it's a new time. It really is, it, it truly is a new time. There's um, this thing that I've spoken with a couple other guests before, but I really want to get into it with you. There, the work and, and um, life balance, home life balance, so to say, whether you're married or not, single, or <clears throat> in, even if you're a student, if it's even school and, and home life balance, those are two polars almost pulling away from each other, moving in other directions, and maybe some small parts uh, touch. There's very few people who have that job satisfaction in our world. You know, the job dissatisfaction is even higher now during the COVID time uh, uh, for, for many of us, but before it was already bad. And only a portion of those two different uh, directions were touching. And most of it was like, okay, I've got to go work 40, 40 hours a week at this place, but I'm spending another 20 hours preparing to go to that place. Mentally, uh, on Sunday, I'm thinking about going to work on Monday. I'm thinking, how can I prepare? What can I wear? And if I'm out, when we, when we had the freedom to go out, and sometimes if you would see a colleague from most normal jobs, you'd like, oh, I don't want to see him. Let's walk the other way. I, I, I don't really like that person. And you're working at a job you don't like, or in a lot of cases, we are, it's, it's different. We enjoy our work and, and uh, hopefully that everybody has that. But, but the reality is, is it's not, and those are polar opposites. But actually to have livability, to have a good social, um, social society in our world, culturally everywhere, those two worlds actually are one. They need to become one that you can trust and have what Tim Liberecht would call in his book, The Business Romantic, a type of romance mm -hmm. with your work where you enjoy your colleagues, you trust them, you want to see them, and um, you can count and rely on them. And they care about you and your family and what you make and your health. And then there's even, you know, there's numerous books. There's Re Reinventing Organizations from Frederick Lalu. There's um, uh, work rules from Laszlo Bach, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, Otto Scharmer, Theory You, but there's all these things about how this work life uh, balance needs to kind of merge, and how do we create now in lockdowns these human zoos, these environments where we can not have domestic violence, where we can enjoy our children, we can have enough technologies and environment and ergonomics to make these new environments work. Um, and, and so with that question is the question that did you know that we are in the age of the Anthropocene of chairs? Not we're in the Anthropocene, but we're in the Anthropocene of chairs per person. There are three to six chairs per person. We are talking six to eight billion chairs on this planet. That's six to eight per person on our planet. That's uh, um, unbelievable, um, that amount of chairs, right? And, and um, actually, it's even more than that. I, so there, we, we have almost... Uh, 8 billion people on our planet, and I think it's 60 to 80 billion chairs uh, on, on our planet. And now in this lockdown, those chairs, they're not doing nothing. We're in the age of the Anthropocene of chairs, and we could talk about tables, and we could talk about technology, and you talk about this as well. So there's a couple of things there that I'd like you to address that kind of hopefully have sparked some, some thoughts and directions that, that we need to go here. Wow, that is, that, is a, that is a really good point, yeah. Quite far beyond how people think. Uh, by the way, that's, I thought in average one person had 10 chairs, so, but 
but even 10 shares are a ton yeah. of shares. Yeah. Yeah. It's tons. So coming, uh, coming, entering this question, um, by the way, Tim Leberecht, one of his first book readings was here at the Vitra campus, I think four years ago That's in uh, September, something like that. He yeah. just had a new book launch last year. I think it was in yeah. September, October yeah. of yeah. last year. I was at his. I met ball. him first in my life eight years ago in California. At that time, um, he was at NBBJ Architects. Yeah, good. So to your point. So currently, um, why we separated spaces? So there was not kind of intersection or transversality. So we really separated. And then we see that uh, our, our, the, the home is not good organized because the home has not kind of a hybrid uh, structure or like a, a smart camper structure where you have a multi-purpose space. And even the office was not a kind of a multi-purpose space. First, second is we are overwhelmed now to live in two worlds. We are still, so by the first lockdown, we go home and we copy our behavior from the office in our homes. And after a while we find out, eh, that makes totally not sense. Then new tools are coming into our life. I make a report, it's called Mapping the, the Remote Work Universe with a student with Merit Zimmermann. And then we count more than 700 remote, remote work tools. What makes them so interesting, so the power of these remote universes, I would say 70% of these tools are synchronous work tools. So a portion of the people could work on one, on one piece, on digital twin, whatever. The old physical architecture of work was asynchronous, ping, pong, ping, pong. So that means in the second wave of the lockdown at home, we come to the point what are the benefits of the virtual space? Then we come to the point, we have to reinvent the old physical space. And now we see, I, I believe you will see now several kinds of examples. Um, there is no one solution, even not from a company. There are companies, they sell now their headquarters. They go in a business like in Seattle, this uh, company, Ray, they, they rent now small satellites because they find out in a foot walking distance or maybe in a 20 minute distance, there are several spots in Seattle. We rent smaller locations that everyone from our company can go there by bicycle. And they don't have to have to commute times. If they have no space at home, they can go there and they meet each other. So you create a sense of belonging. I think that is a kind of solution. So other ones believe, okay, so we have our headquarter and now we, the headquarter is, is much more like, we name it a Vitra, the club. We really reinvent it as a club. And we do kind of a new program that means there is a person who takes care, who creates an interesting program. What happens during the week in the club that people say, I have to go there because there are one desire. So one, is, one desire is to be part of a bigger portion of people, of a tribe. It's called belonging. And second is to develop your own potential. It's like learnability. And for that reason now, companies start to rebuild their headquarters. And for these people, which don't have um, the opportunity to work from home, they make deals with the local co-workers to say, come on, I want to have a flat rate for my employees for one reason, that the most of them go to the same spot Again, that they meet each other, yeah, so that you still have a sense of belonging. And what I believe now the super advantaged companies, what they do, they set up a digital twin of the company. They're inspired by the gaming industry who provides super virtual spaces so that even if I'm not able to come to the Vitra campus, maybe in one or two years from now, I take my Oculus and I get a really great experience. It's like, I'm there, yeah? And I believe in the following, in, in this generation Z, who spend a lot of time in a virtual space comparing to a physical, 
that maybe for these guys it's it's quite normal to, to use um, to, to stay in a mixed reality. So we will see now, I, I believe monthly, new good examples how people deal, deal with that. Ah, another last example. I live in the countryside. What happens now in the countryside, there are smart majors that see, hey, they, there are some people who have a bad uh, wireless connection at home, so a bad broadband connection, or they have no space. So what they do, they find in their, in their countryside places where the majors say, okay, I give this place to the people who don't want to commute to the city as their kind of mini co-working on the countryside. And now we, there are some good examples around and, and I believe what that helps us, that brings really freedom to the people, freedom to have a choice, to find a great spot and, um, and in average, the people commute in the world, in average, the people commute in the world 10 days a year, 10 days. Think about that. Yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely amazing. So there's, I mean, there's so many different facets of, of what we're talking about that we could branch off into almost any of them. Um, you know, e even just specifically talking about what the ergonomics, what does your space look like at home in your home office and, and how does that future of work look like, whether you where you live, what's the connection like? Do you have to still travel? Things like that. Those are all shifting. And in that, in that shift, what we're what we're seeing is for most places, this sustainable infrastructure emerging. So broadband internet, uh, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of companies shipping chairs and desks and computer monitors and all sorts of things, offering tools of iPads to their employees to be able to continue to work from home. We're seeing that before companies that say, oh, you can work from home one day a month, that they're like, oh, it's totally fine. And they're seeing that the productivity and that whole thing is shift. And as you, as, you, as you also mentioned so correctly, that a lot of companies are reevaluating saying, we're paying an enormous amount of space for, the, for these offices, um, especially um, in, in the banking blue collar areas, they're saying like, well, this is just extremely uh, something that could be digitized, can be changed. We're wasting so much that, that they're now going satellites and they're downgrading a lot. Um, on these physical spaces. And so there's a lot of changes. We're right at, a, at, a, at the crux of, of a unique time that, that we're seeing this. I've always, and for at least um, 20 years now, felt like, um, like sitting was the new smoking. And that's, why, that's kind of why I shifted to standing at work in this ergonomics. And I come from a long background of, of uh, uh, health, safety, OSHA compliance, occupational health and safety environment. So how, what do the ergonomics of work look like? And then it went from that to, to compliance. And then it went from that to corporate social responsibility. And then it went, now it's an environmental social governance. But it all really started back with health and safety. How can you work no matter what your work environment is? Do you have personal protection equipment? Do you have good ergonomics and things? So I've always kind of been thinking in one respect or the other of the future work and how can we do it that we don't have repetitive motion uh, injuries when we work with carpal tunnel or, or back issues, whatever it is, because those are the biggest things uh, just in the reality, regardless of sustainability and, and environment, those are the biggest things that create numerous problems with uh, human suffering, health problems, which then lead to your employees calling in sick and having issues at work. I, I would bring there in another perspective. So if you, if you look at the end of the 2010 years, the most disease at work was brain disease. So like burnout and all the other cases. So, and, and I, the, the, the ratio of these disease like uh, to, to your body, like, like to your back or things like that, that was, I think they go 
up to 13 or 40 percent, 14 percent only, comparing to 30 years ago. Think about the programs in the companies. They a lot of them they have the sport facilities inside. They make programs if they have yoga classes, mindfulness. So there was a good movement. No, I believe there was a very good movement in the entire biophilic design and also well-being movement. So that was, I think, that was really highly increasing in 2016, 17, 18, 19 in Asia, in the US and also in Europe. Um, so that, that was in a good way, but even that topic changed now. Absolutely. Because if you go now to the office, I think there is one challenge in the future as more repetitive tasks are taken over by soft and hardware, as more we have kind of creators work. If you look to the skills published by the World Economic Forum, the new 10 skills, five, the first five of them are about creativity, intuition, and the other five about your technical skills. skills. So as more we work in a creation mode, as more we need a regeneration mode. So what I believe, in the near area to these office spaces, there must be like areas um, where you say, okay, I take a nap, I make a rest. There is a park. If maybe there is a, there is an, um, an, a garden on the, on the top or in the atrium or like in the near field, or maybe there are meditation spaces, spaces for that. Because I believe in the future, the biggest portion of of our work is driven by creativity and that really sucks energy yeah so even as long we interact like with i would not say old devices but like with these kind of machines yeah yeah i i i totally agree with you and uh, that, that brings me perfect and our discussion perfectly to kind of some of your past talks and, and i want to bring bring them up to speed. So when I start my presentation, I also use the overview effect. I er use earth rise and I show the blue marble. You do that as well, uh, as well, but you do it in a different context. And then uh, you also discuss, now we're in the 51st year of, uh, of the moon landing and uh, you show, you know, the first, uh, 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 when the first astronauts go into the moon and the, their spacesuits and the inside of the shuttle, this last year, 2020, with the uh, year of the pandemic, was unbelievable for rocket launches, Mars, uh, Elon Musk, all the space travel. And we saw a change in the working environment in space, not only in their suits, the type of machines and rockets that they were going into that you know we went from when, when i used to look at the old nasa uh uh shuttles and and uh, not only the space shuttle but the the sputniks and the rockets before i like how in the hell do you not get overwhelmed and totally go crazy there are so many buttons i would be worried in that big clunky spacesuit that you would bump something right uh, or flip the wrong switch and then you've just uh, lost all your f fuel or, or something like that and uh, now there's 12 buttons and three touch screens and it's like mainly automated there's not a damn thing to do you look you watch the astronauts and they're they're busy trying to figure out what to do with their hands because uh, there's nothing to do anymore and so we've taken a quantum leap into reality of the, not only the future of space travel, but the future of how we work and where we work. And so I want you to kind of take us why you talk about the earth rise and why you talk about that and, and how that ties to the future of work and what you do in this trends as well. Uh, uh, because I think we, we have a lot of similarities how that ties together. Oh, by the way, I was also surprised when I've seen inside the rocket because there was no button anymore. There were only the discreets. And even how the astronauts looks like, I say, eh? this is an astronaut dress, not more? Because I love the old astronaut dress, these like <laughs> going like in the special suits. Okay, why I joined that? Look. Um, we lose, uh, I was more and more confrontated that the, that the customers or the society in general was criticless. So that means 
They take all the things how they are. They never thought about that. And they only thought three or five meters ahead, not, not far away. They never go beyond. And I want to show them, I want to really show them how important it is to look beyond, to get the full picture, to th because context, it's really important to think in these context stories. You can't reduce complexity by reducing complexity. You have to deal with complexity, but you can understand complexity to train yourself to build a mindset. And I was inspired by Akio Toyota last year on the CES in Las Vegas. <clears throat> Akio Toyota go on the stage and he doesn't bring a car, a brand new car to Las Vegas. He brought a story. He shared with us the story of Toyota, of his father and of his grandfather, that Toyota always served the society to make the life for the society easier. And, um, and he would love to have a glass ball to understand when cars could fly, when a car is getting a robot like Transformer, or when a car pick him up at home only by a, hey, car, come over. But then he talked to us, but that is a romance because, but he learned so many, the Toyota car company learned so many about the future by building cars, by getting a kind of an overview and a foresight, foresight mindset that they came up with 40 new fields. And these 40 new fields are dedicated to the society because the most of them <clears throat> are matching with the SDGs and with the global, with the mankind challenges. And for that reason, he don't build a small lab, he built an entire city on 157 hectares with Bjarke Ingels. And I thought, oh my God, what a strong commitment. How that person can make so a strong commitment. And by researching and talking to the Toyota people, I find out, hey, they are well prepared. They know, they really get the overview. They really know how to deal with the presence or how take the presence to, to predict a picture into the future, yeah? And even how to deal with the past and to know what to transform and what not to transform, what could be heritage. And so I start with the overview effect. And after the overview effect, I bring in 51 years later, now 52 years later, Akio Toyota. What happens if you have your personal overview? What happens if you have a long-term perspective? Ah, and by the way, my personal career into the trend, trend, um, trend topic or foresight topic starts as the DLD in Munich, thanks to Hubert Borda. In 2010, I met Bertrand Piquin and he changed my life in a 30 minute speech. He told, he, he tell us a story about how important it is in life to have a weatherman, to have the long-term perspective. If you are the pilot, he talked to us in the audience, you're all great pilots, but don't forget you need a body and this body is your weatherman and you have to deal with them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did, did you happen to hear um, my talk at La Futura at all? Yeah. I, I, I actually know Bertrand Picard as well. He's the owner of Solar Impulse and 1000 Solutions. And he also is the first man to fly around the world in a solar airplane. And so I love that. He, he likes to deal with pioneers and innovators, those people who do not know that it is not impossible that, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so he deals, you know, for his solar airplane, he dealt with shipbuilders instead of airplane builders because the airplane builders all said, no, it's not possible. We don't know how to do it. So he went to those who didn't know it was impossible and got it done. And uh, that's a lot kind of how the, the future works. And, and for many of us, and as, as looking at these trends, now, we're in the decade of not only the decade of action, the decade of regeneration, regenerative thinking, and also um, the decade of this, you know, circular economy, doing the impossible, inventing things uh, as pirate pioneers for the future. And so Innovators Magazine has interviewed him and worked with him in the past. And I also, he's He's a very inspiring. That's I think that was the last time you and I saw each other 
was at DLD in Munich. It was, and um, no, it was in Davos. Yeah, it was in 2020, and then at Davos, and I, later we went down to Davos uh, right after. And actually, it started out as a bang. The year was uh, going great, and um, I, I, even after Davos, I still had a couple events before the 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 true craziness happened. Um, that brings in another topic. So we're right now in this uh, extreme uh, next lockdown here in Germany. And um, now they're saying, okay, no more cloth made homemade masks that were the Instagram crave that everybody is making their own masks and, and these that we need a medical mask and uh, it has to be changed out and repurposed uh, a, a lot more. Uh, you know, all these new social distancing measures, we finally got the vaccine, but now the, the, the situation of the vaccine is such that uh, I think we have six different choices, but um, it's being delivered and rolled out at least here in Germany in a certain way. Um, and you'll be notified when it comes. But even when we get it, here, here's, the, here's the, the interesting thing that I wanna discuss with you is, it doesn't mean that the masks go away. It doesn't mean that the social distancing goes away or, um, you know, or some of these measures, because even with the vaccine, you can still be a carrier. And so um, you and I are thinking not only about the future of work, but the future of life, because those two are combined. So now does this, we know that other pandemics, other things will be coming um, uh, and, and we're working towards a better future but what does that look like? Does the next thing now where we're going to wear a gas mask or we're going to wear a space suit or we're going to wear an oxygen mask because the vaccine isn't really helping anything until that herd immunity is reached. And we're talking, you know, close to 8 billion people on our planet, um, you know, seven something. And um, so now the question is, do we need some better trends in, in medicine and, and vaccines and better trends in how we work and live ability because as you say, we need this social interaction, we're social beings. So uh, what is the hope that somehow um, through the technologies, the things that are emerging that you're working on, that you're probably hopefully talking about where companies are thinking about this, where, where are we going next? At, at least in your areas of expertise, is that just that that's the new that's the new norm i guess we're all we're all going to continue social distancing and mask because that herd immunity is not something that's going to happen and now we've seen mutations as well and so i don't want to belabor the point but we need to get into realities how do we solve these problems or what are these things that we can not get back to a new normal but create a system for better futures good point mark really good point I think first, what we have to do, and we should start, I would not say, we should start this year with that, that we as a society start to understand why that could happen. So thinking in a context to know why that could happen. So that, that means as long as we deal with the planet in that term, it will happen again. And to come now to the footprint moment, to come to the handprint moment, to real, to be critical to yourself, like, okay, Rafa, is this necessary to go by car? Is it necessary to buy this car, even if you live in the countryside? And in the larger portion, to be part of a community inside the organization to take over responsibility. I honestly believe that every the brand of a company. The value of a brand of every company on the planet up to five years from now will be, will, will, will be combined with the impact of the company to the society and even to the planet, like out of this planet centricity of this SDG model. I can't believe that there will be any brand in 2025 or 2030 which is high ranked, which don't take care about this issue. Second is every organization, it's not enough for a company to have only a um, commercial layer. You also have to have a society layer. The society layer could be cultural, 
education or maybe the 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 climate change topic like a kind of a citizenship for these kind of topic and and then we are then when then really can start a, a big movement so to bring this topic closer to all of us and <clears throat> i think the most the most important point is that we how to say that we connect each other again with nature look for me it's totally easy to be connected with nature because i live in the outback i see now how many birds are on my feeding station in winter comparing to winter 2020 2019 2016 15 10 and i let you know there are less birds on the feeding station i can let you know what happens with the draw during the year because we have two big water pounds and we have to refill the water pounds out of our big water basins from our roof so that means i'm aware not because i'm so smart because i live in the context with nature so and 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 we should reconnect us with nature again and it should start at school we should even the let, let the normal school like the school is in Germany. I don't talk about this like the Alemannen school in Germany, which yeah. has a super, <clears throat> super program for the kids. So what would happen if maybe 15 or 25 percent of the education would happen outside? That is a kind of a beginning. Yeah. The, the, other, the other topic is <clears throat> that we should provide um, ourselves a kind of footprint or handprint index that you know what is your consumption like look i know i get every year a letter from the german retirement organization what is the prediction of my uh, retirement salary or payment why i don't get by the government the paper <laughs> what is the prediction of my carbon footprint <laughs> it, by year by year like a rafa you have if you want to make a contribution my recommendation is go to that points i can give you the answer to that is because we're uh, all over the world we're not based on an ecological economy we're based on a, a capitalistic economy so on uh, on on a uh, very intensive um economies that that that's that's why you don't get that uh, and I think that a lot of our economies and things are, are really failing us. And um, I, I agree 100% with you on reconnecting to nature. I think that is so vital and it is the key. It's proven there's, there's studies, you know, uh, just taking a walk in nature, being around trees, that uh, what it does to, for your health and your psyche and and uh, your emotion uh, is is fabulous. And and. The other thing that really connects to what you're saying, which is really been come, so the pandemic is horrific, but a lot of things have been bubbling to the surface and it's shown a microscope on where our problems are, where, what we need to fix and what we really need to change. And, and for that, I really am, am thankful. And one of the biggest areas, what we're now seeing, it has ties to, to, to livability, to the future of work that we've been discussing, is New York, um, Shanghai, uh, Wuhan, um, Tokyo, um, Munich, um, all the big cities in the world, even Hamburg, people are realizing and they're making a mass exodus um, out of these big cities. Uh, New York has not had uh, so many vacancies and so many people live, leave during 2020 and 2021 already, um, not only because of the craziness, but because there's no need to be in a big city. They wanna go somewhere where the livability factor is a little bit better because now they realize I can do my job from anywhere and to pay these high exorbitant amounts of money where I've maybe lost my job already or um, I can work from home. I'd rather have my home work life be a little bit better. So you see all these people 
now going out trying to find i've heard more farm purchases more land purchases more house purchases yeah. um, um all sorts of things not in, in europe it's a, a lot of talk about denmark and sweden properties that they're buying and they're going to spain um people are saying no thank you we're moving we're we're going to find something better and so we see these shifts and it, it's pretty substantial um, and I, I'm going off of a lot of numbers from New York because I'm from the U.S., but we're, we're actually seeing that, that the people, it's not just that they want to live better, but they also want to reconnect with nature. They want to be somewhere further away. They say, I'm going to take a break and walk out in the nature. I, 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 I had on, Mon on Tuesday, I listened to uh, a broadcasting, live broadcasting by the Alfred Herrhausen Society, from Frankfurt and the London School of Economics. And one of the guests was Richard Florida. And, and, and he mentioned the point uh, that the topic was about the social order in these cities, in the old cities, so they don't work anymore. I talked to a colleague from me in Tokyo and Tokyo is missing 15 million people a day, the city of Tokyo. So that means the, the old ecosystem don't work anymore. So that means now you have two, th two things. In the rural area, you play out of the offense because it's highly attracting. The major now is in the spotlight. He can say, oh, how cool is that? I can bring a value now in that area. People are, come, are coming. I can make improvement in schools, in kindergarten, in all the other things, what I could not have done before. But the cities now are playing out of the defense because they really have to reinvent themselves. And there is a good institution in Barcelona, it's called placemaking.org. So they start this kind of placemaking movement. And what happens now in cities is like, for sure, like in Frankfurt. While the pandemic, people have to stay in their city so they can go over weekend to another city, to another country. And then they, thought, then they really understand what their city is. Now they have a kind of expectation to the city. Why we don't have bing, bang, bong, bang. Yeah. And even maybe the authorities say, hey, we have an issue. We have to do something. And I believe, I highly believe this will be a strong society movement that people take care, take over a portion of responsibility and say, hey, let us start a kind of a placemaking project for our city and let us find what is our own domain. So what is our domain? We are not Copenhagen, we are not Paris, we are not Munich, we are maybe Wuppertal or Duisburg or whatever. Yeah, the, the, the other thing I kind of want to clarify <clears throat> for my listeners is you and I are both speaking from a place of uh, enormous privilege. So we're very fortunate to be living where we are fairly good social infrastructure, fairly good infrastructure, period. We're, we're not suffering. And, and, and even in New York, to some extent, even though there's the boroughs and the Bronx and, and different things, um, there, there's a lot of pockets of some really poor and, and, and bad places. But th that's still the Western world. That's the developed world. But if you're seeing those exodus in those areas, please understand if you come from that perspective that there is another exodus that we call refugees still going on. And it's still going to grow because of people um, for all different reasons that now become climate refugees or conflict refugees or things that are going on in Belarus or, and that, that they are now saying, um, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going, I have to be a refugee. And, and, and so that all goes back to the very basic of things. Sustainable development, which is an infrastructure, livability, and the future of, of, of where we're going and how we work. And so that's why I've been very blessed to, to have you on the show to discuss this, to kind of have some uh, exchange of topics and hear you know, what your discoveries are. And go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Mark, I, I prepare my, myself uh, over the weekend for a workshop and I read um, uh, two papers. One paper was from McKinsey 
I don't want to make advertising, but it was about formerly they had this climate risk report and now it's only called like the climate report. And, um, and there was, they have some balance sheet to see what happens to infrastructure. So how are the costs to repair infrastructure and all the things out of these climate issues? What happens in the south of Spain, like, or like Turkey in this belt uh, close to the equator by temperature? Uh, or think about, there was a movie now in The Economist and they brought it for an example, the Napa Valley. Uh, 10 years ago, they had six days over 40 degrees. Now they have an entire month with this period. And they believe half of all wineries could not operate in beginning from 2030. And now, and, and you brought another story in, a thing about the Southern area of the Sahara. There is no chance to live there maybe in 15 years from now. And that really keeps me up at night. And what I don't understand, 20 years ago, there was a strong movement from the thought leaders in digitalization. The, these are these companies what are highly successful today. Why we don't take climate change as an opportunity, like the digital agenda, put the same efforts in to be at the end, at the forefront of this movement? One of, one of my biggest, um, 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 not, I, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of him. I like him and when our paths has crossed before I'm a graduate of Singularity University, but Peter Diamandis said it so well in uh, his book, Bold and Abundance, and uh, he founded Singularity University and does many different things uh, as well. But he says, you know, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. And I don't see that in a capitalistic or negative way. What I see is that if you help 1 billion people, you automatically become a billionaire, but you've also solved the problem of a billion people and you've made an impact for the future uh, of life, of, of work, of, of things. And people have more than one problem. So I really think that we need to get not only in that mindset as, as those of us in business and those of us who, who are, are trying to do things for the future, but in reality that every one of us is a, is a passenger on this spaceship earth and we can all put our hand on the steering wheel. There's only really two small points in our life where, we're, where we can't be considered passengers. And that's one as a baby uh, and one where we're so elderly and frail that, that there's not much we can do. In those respects, you're actually still a, 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 not a crew member, not a passenger. You're actually a crew member guiding that. Um, but we all need to realize that we have that potential to change and impact the future. So my, my very first real question, even though we've been talking for an hour now, is do you feel like a global citizen and how would you feel about a world with the removal of all borders, walls and division of humanity one for another? Oh. Look, uh, two things. First, I got the privilege to visit more than 35 countries for Vitra. And by that visiting, while I'm so curious, I always get access to the people there, talking to them. And I have the same, I have always the same radar. It's like understanding culture, understanding um, society, understanding the businesses in that country. So what kind of businesses drive that country? and understanding the history of the country. So, and for that, so before I go there, I Google a little bit, read some books, quack, quack, quack. So, so that means um, I got the privilege to get the full picture to see, hey, Rafa, you are not alone on this planet. So first, second, I have the privilege to live on a farm. My wife is running an organic concept store. So since 12 years, we, all the things we buy at home are fair produced, are organic, and all the things. We tried not to waste something. We rebuild our farm in biodiversity. 
So by we get trained by someone who's the expert. So my gardener is not an ordinary gardener. So. And here in, 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 in myself, there's a strong voice. I'm now 51 and, and I have tons of energy, but what I want to do is now to that what you mentioned before, with one hand maybe on this kind of steering wheel to, to make a bigger impact as I've done that before. The last six years, I go out and talk about the future of work in a missionary way, but in a good sense of that point to motivate and to inspire the people to say, hey, come on, there's much more in for you to make, to bring a change, to bring, to bring a change into the way how you work today, how you're employed, what you do, to be closer to your company, to endeavor, quack, quack, quack. And, and there's one wish for me in the same way, I want to do that out of this climate topic, yeah. So currently I'm, I, 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 my, my personal interest is the city because the neighborhood of the future of work for sure is the city. Um, the city is a good example for me because that is a, a, a big spot. You mean there are tons of people. So if you bring a change into the city, this change has an impact. Yeah? And the idea is to do that from inside to impact. So currently I'm studying, I'm reading, I try to meet the people who are city experts. I want to understand who, who owns the city because the cities are not owned by the citizen. They are owned by pension funds, by um, asset companies, by investment boutiques. And I believe if you address the biggest problem of the world, maybe to the people who have the money to can make a change, that could be a way Definitely. to inspire them. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks for that answer. That that was uh, was beautiful because really, the COVID is a global citizen. Food is a global citizen. Species and animals are global citizens. They move across borders, and um, we've seen that you know, uh, water, air, all those things are are really global citizens. And so I like how you kind of put that in, in in to personal perspective of not only your travels but. How, how you see and reflect on the world. My hardest question for you today is really the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, um, although we have all asked each other that, it's what's the future? I believe that the future is much more brighter than we think now because we understand, we underestimate the power of the next generation. We maybe underestimate the, the good sense of new technologies. And uh, this is for me a good combination that maybe if you read the books in 2040 that there is published that in the beginning of the 2020s start a movement. It's like, um, I don't know if you name it, the planet centricity movement or take care about the planet or the ownership planet, however. And it starts maybe like in, from government side, companies, people, countryside, cities, city districts, however. Maybe that is a common goal, yeah, hopefully. There um, is, is kind of a similar question to that as well, but I wanna combine it um, with something and, and I'm gonna put you on the spot. I'm gonna make you think. So if smoke start com coming out of your ears, I'll stop the recording. Um, just, I don't want you to spontaneously combust, but I want you to tell me what does a world that works for everyone look like for you, for you, not for Merkel or the governments or the US. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And um, somehow this message should have the power 
to impact and change people's life. So I, I often think about when I had the best time in my life in terms of uh, to live a calm life because everything was, how to say, was in, 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 in rituals, no speedy. And I think that was the time, something between, I don't know, 12 and maybe 18, something like that. And in that time, uh, when I remember that time, for me, it was like, we, we all are the same. There was no race and nothing. My mother is from Spain, so I go frequently to Spain and Spain in that years was totally different, different like today. But even there, the people was happy and they enjoy their life. They have the rituals, they take care about the family. So they, they have their freedom because Spain in that time was, I think then 20 years, 15 or 20 years um, after Franco. And, and for sure it is not, we don't have this time yet um, because what is missing is respect. What is missing is the empathy to understand the other one before you say he's an asshole or something like that. Yeah, so do, are, are, are you telling me that what a, wor what a world that works for everyone looks like for you is one with more calmness, more respect, more, more, sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And even that the people feel free. Often you talk to people like what's here in Germany and and it seems like for them they are they are not their own sovereign. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're not they're they don't have their sovereignty, yeah. So to and, and even how, how to deal with your life, what to do. So to and not in terms, I don't want to say that you sit the entire day for the TV and looking Netflix, not about that. And this is, I think that that would be for me a kind of a picture. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a different form of uh, serenity, uh, peace. Uh, yeah. That uh, I think it's based. I think it's based for sure on peace, on freedom, and uh, and 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 also to be humble a little bit. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, and to and to enjoy the things around you, yeah, to enjoy your your surrounding, your environment, the nature, the, the these these quite easy things. Yeah. Well, I, I'm gonna uh, hopefully not get you in trouble with all your customers or your clients and those companies that you probably haven't seen that much uh, in person last year and this year. But I want to ask you what, um, with, with all the companies that you deal with, when you speak to them about the future of work, when you present them with new solutions, when you talk to them about the trends and, and, and things, um, I, I'm assuming they're not rocket companies. They're not the Teslas and the Apples and these super big companies that have got this clear vision of the future. What do you tell them or what are your frustrations? I kind of like for you to tell me um, what your story and message is to them and how you help them to get up to speed for the future, kind of, if, if you don't mind. That is a good point. Look, I was at one point, I, I say to myself, I don't want to waste time. I don't want to go anymore in any caves to bring the people out of the cave to let them know how life could be. But then I have to change my method. like how to inspire them for sure. So the most of them are struggling. So the most of them, they are all super pilots. It's like similar to the story of Bertrand Picard. And what is missing is because they are quarterly driven to get first a long-term perspective. That is first missing, a long-term perspective. Why? Because they are, the measurement is quarterly. Second is, um, to really go beyond, that is the entire story about provoke, explore, discover, because what they do always is immediately design. They believe there is an issue, 
they don't take the time for proper framing and immediately they come with ideas design. And so what I try to help them is start with provoke, what if question, start then to discover and explore what is going around in terms of bench learning, exploration, social learning, and then go to design. And I compare me often, I, I tell them often as a story, I'm a little bit like the Falcon 9 record, uh, a rocket. A rocket needs around, needs around um, uh, one, up to two minutes to be in the non-gravity area. So, and my job is to bring them in a non-gravity area comparing to their, that they don't stuck in anymore in their own business gravity, yeah. And for them, this is often how to say the future is often for these kind of companies, something like, ah, come on, don't talk about the future. Uh, the future is there, 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 there. Yeah, come on, I have to deliver. I have to deliver. But you, you know, you can learn a lot about these farmers who live from the forest. The farmers who live from the forest have to think in three generations. Come on, in the three generations. If I see today something, the kids of my kids would get these kind of trunks and that teach us the history. That's beautiful. I, I love that. Um, I only have three more things for, for you and they're for my audience, for my listeners. It's um, information that tips and advice that you can give them. And so, um, the, the first one is really, if you were to depart one message that had, uh, that was a sustainable takeaway for my listeners that had the power to change their life, what would it be? To train the curiosity and, and to leave as often your discipline. So go beyond your discipline and talk to people outside your industry and outside the business you are, who, are who you are trained in. I think this is super important. If you really want to learn something new, you have to do that. Second F, you have to understand that you have to unlearn. You mentioned uh, Otto Schachner yeah, with the U theory, yeah, this kind of unlearning to, be, to have also the willingness to unlearn something because it's quite difficult. Yeah. And third, the best Yoda of everything is nature. Nature could teach you everything. You don't have to be Alexander von Humboldt. No, it's good to read his books, but you don't have to be Alexander von Humboldt. But as often you go to nature and you, and you, you take all your senses to understand weekly, after a year, you know which kind of tree is good, which is bad, what is working, what is not working, and then you, you, you try to understand, to endeavor the world around you as an ecosystem. And I think this is a good example. That is always helpful. That's fabulous. I, I um, just released a podcast today, matter of fact, with Mark Dorfman from Biomimicry 3.8. And uh, this bio, biomimicry of, of nature is really amazing innovations, amazing tools um, that we can learn. So I'm in full alignment and, and that's why we released that podcast to, today. Um, what should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they are looking for, for ways to make real impact on the future of work, the future of, 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 of really how we interact with each other? If they were going to, to copy, say, damn, he's got the coolest job. I want to do that. What, 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 would, so, what would it be? First, they should go always to the most progressive companies they can go as an internship, for an internship, for a job, or even for a freelance job. Go always to the best ones that, that they really push your own boundaries and you can learn so much. Second, be kind, find out who's the Yoda inside the organization, be kind to that person and learn so much you can learn. Third is, history is important to learn something. Whenever you're in a new city, go into the museum. Whenever you visit a country, go on Wikipedia and read what happens in that country 100 years before. 
because history also is a good teacher. We have, I think in our epochs, we have, I think, I would believe we have 100 Corona epochs in 2,500 years of mankind. Yeah? And that I would uh, recommend to, to the young ones. And the last question is, is what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Wow. I would say this is the best question I ever got in the interview in the last six years, honestly. And I will copy that question and say, that is from Mark Buckley. That is, <laughs> boom. Okay. A lot of people- I would say contextual thinking. I would say contextual thinking. Okay. I, I would say to, I want to say thank you here to two persons, two colleagues of Vitra. Uh, one is Chrissy, Chrissy Moore. Uh, currently she's running her own company. Um, she, she's a super, super analyst and researcher. I learned so much about context thinking from, contextual thinking from her. And the other person, he's retired also from Vitra, Jürgen Dürrbaum. He teached me also out of the history of the company to th the contextual thinking. And uh, I need for that kind of learning session to become 44 years. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear. And it's also a nice accolade to those colleagues. Uh, in some respects, I continually get this feeling when we speak or when, um, that you're really an entrepreneur within Vitra, that you're like this, you're almost running this whole other business within inside of Vitra in some respects, or it's a, it is your baby, but it's like this, you have such, freedom and uh, ability to kind of creativity to really go out, come in, share, grow. It's, it's, it's beautiful. That's just how, <clears throat> from my point here in Hamburg, uh, uh, I see it. But um, I hope that we see each other physically very, very soon. Hopefully it'll be in May in Singapore at the, the World Economic Forum. That would be great. Uh, um, uh, I don't know if DLD is going to go back to having some events anytime soon or this year, but hopefully we'll see each other soon. And I really thank you, unless there's anything else you want to say about you or Vitra that you didn't get a chance. Now is your time. Otherwise, I'm done with my questions. First, thank you very much, Mark. I invite you to Vitra, and I promise you, you will get here two fantastic, great days with ton of insight that we inspire you. Second to the audience, I have a giant archive, a digital archive, it is my Flipboard and it's open to everybody. It's called Raphael's Flipboard and you get access to around 3000 articles. So feel free to go in there about how we work, how we learn technology, society, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Whenever the Vitra campus is open again and you go along, maybe you go to Italy or to Switzerland for holiday, you should visit us. This is a place, if you want to get an idea what it means, build places, this is a place here where you could learn a lot and get a lot of inspiration. Thank you. We definitely will. And I'll put all those links in the show note description so that everybody can go and see you virtually, digitally, and find your websites and everything. Um, um, but we, I hope my listeners take you up on that and, uh, find out, say, Hey, you said it on the podcast. I'm coming by to visit. Thanks so much, Rafa. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.